TikTok, time to rock. How is everyone doing this lovely evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you may be? Since I'm here with uh, Mike Lacona, who's a historical Jesus scholar, I thought it would be a good idea to sit down, go through case for the resurrection. What do you guys think of that? Hmm? Not a good idea? Um, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Wait. You know what this guy's talking about? This guy says, uh, bet you Lacona will do his he said, she said shtick. Is that what you're going to do? <laughs> You know what he? You know what he's talking about? I would guess that whoever this person is is thinking that it's just going to be. Well, he said. That's right. But I guess that's what we have for all history, isn't yeah. it? it? So it's it's more along the lines of he said, and here's why we trust what this person says. That's exactly right. If you're going to do the he said, she said thing and pull that against Christianity, you do that with everything. You say, well, how do we know really the Holocaust happened? It's a he said, she said. It's all he said, she said. Caesar crossed the Rubicon. Come on. He said, she said. We don't know anything. We don't know anything about history. Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Yeah, he said. <laughs> uh, Kong Fuzzy said, hi, David and Mike. How you doing, Kong? Um, yeah, so we'll probably, uh, for the first couple minutes here, uh, just let people, uh, just let people come in and, um, then we can kind of proceed however, however Mike would like, um, but, uh, probably have some, some introductory stuff on his approach, which is similar to the approach of, uh, Gary Habermas. Um, so we'll have a little bit of introduction to methodology and so on, and then, uh, basically laying out the facts that, that historians can establish um, about Jesus. And this is important because I don't know if you know, Mike, but there are atheists who think we can't know anything about Jesus, even that he existed. You heard of this before? Yeah, of course, this isn't new. It's been around for some time, um, but it, it, it's never really accepted by scholars and professional historians. So it just goes out of vogue, and then later on it comes back in by pop-level folks uh, who just aren't typically, you know, they're not historically minded and they just hear it's the village atheist kind of people and they bring mm -hmm. it up. So, yeah. And you have your Holocaust deniers. You have people who say we never walked on the moon. So you do have folks that are on the fringe. Um, so we can't speak of ever with just about anything with that we have a hundred percent consensus, but we can say, you know, a virtual consensus. Are you comparing Jesus mythers to Holocaust yeah. deniers? Yeah, I'd say so. In fact, there's probably as many historians who deny the Holocaust as there are professional historians, scholars in the relevant fields who deny that Jesus ever existed. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, <clears throat> let me see. Uh, someone said, where did that go? Let me check this real quick. Um, the real 575 said, David, you have echo feedback. Uh, guys, tell me if that is indeed the case. I only have, I do not have a professional microphone here. So I did not bring a professional microphone with me. So I have the mic on my computer, the mic on my laptop here, and I have the mic that is with uh, Mike's webcam here that I'm using. I do so, have a professional one if you want me to get it. What, what's, it what's it like? It, it's, it's awesome. It's a Shure. Uh, is it plug into USB? Yep. yep. Why don't we do that? All right, let's go ahead and try that. All right, so I'm taking over the live stream now. Well, Mike grabs a mic. Uh, just tell me if that is indeed the case, if there's a problem with the sound. Because, yeah, there's no mic in, but the mic that's built into the computer isn't isn't tremendously great. Oh, hey, some people, ah, oh, they're lying. <laughs> All right, everyone said there's no echo. Who was that? Real 575 Real. everyone said the audio is fine. That means that was in your computer, dude. That was in your computer. You can't be penalizing me for what was in your computer. So for, for all future reference, hey, everyone said there is no echo. That was a lie. But we might as well hook, if you got a mic, we might as well hook yeah. it up. Ah, I'm going to get the stand off. <clears throat> Let's see. So Dariel is either a liar and a saboteur, or <laughs> it's just on Dereal's, uh, uh personal laptop. Um, Hexata said, 
you always have these live streams at the worst time for us Europeans. Uh, Hexitas, um, yeah, basically, I do them on uh, do live streams at eight o'clock East Coast time because that's still early enough to where people who are now off work haven't gone to bed yet on the East Coast, but it's still um, it's there's still time for people who live in the middle of the country or in the West to be off work so they can do it. So what I'm hearing is that I should schedule my live streams according to European time, which would be in the middle of the workday here. Is that, is that what you're saying? Is that what you think would be a good idea, Hexitas? I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, maybe one live stream a month, maybe one live stream a month, we'll, we'll schedule it specifically for Europeans. It'll have to be probably on a weekend, um, but we'll do it at like two in the afternoon or something like that, uh, which would be good for, for Europeans. But if you're saying, hey, all my live streams should be scheduled on European time, yeah, that one's under investigation there. Um, well, once your European followers become greater than those of us over here, mm -hmm. do you consider that? <laughs> hey, look, <laughs> Mr. Dry Rye, that, that's, that's, the, that's the guy who said, oh, it's going to be he, sh he said, she said. <laughs> he said, but that's your shtick, isn't it? Isn't that your shtick? He said, she said. Mr. Dry Rye, maybe you missed the point. If you're talking about uh, we're using evidence because someone said it. Yeah, that's all of history. That's how history is done, right? That's how history works. People wrote stuff down. People saw stuff. People heard stuff. People witnessed stuff. People wrote it down. And then we look at the documents and try to establish what we can know historically because we do know that human beings make mistakes. We do know that human beings can lie. And that's why historians use criteria to figure out whom we can trust and what facts we can know about history. Um, so if you're if you're saying, yeah, that's how history is done, but it's it's all just he said, she said. I'm going to be honest, you sound like a moron to me. I'm, I, I'm you know, I'm just going to be blunt. You sound like a moron if you're throwing out all of history because it's he said, she said stuff. Right. Don't, don't claim that you can know anything to us. Uh, I mean, how, how would we even I mean, gosh, how would we even know that you're real and it's not a, a monkey typing something in. Right. I mean, if you're, if you're going to become that skeptical to where we can't know anything about history, I could be just as skeptical and say, how do I even know that this person exists and it's not a monkey randomly hammering keys on a keyboard? Dude, the point is, dude, if, if that's your view of history, get off the live stream. Don't go to a historical discussion of the evidence if you don't believe in history or evidence. Right? Just, just go away. Um, all right. We're going to try to plug in a mic here. But it turns out everyone said that the sound was fine. Yeah, this, this should make it warmer, though. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna test this out just in case this is in fact better. Oh, would it be better? What just happened? Okay, all right, that came back. All right, now go ahead and change the speaker. I'm gonna change. I'll change the mic. Mic. Yep. There you go, Scarlet. So, Scarlet. Yep. All right, we're gonna try this. Tell us if this sounds better, and then we will know. Um, although I should probably put this here, and we'll put this like yay. Okay. All right. All right, testing. How's that sound? Testing, testing. Tell us, tell us if that is uh, better, uh, the same as, or worse than the original. Check, check, check one. Check, check one. How's this? <laughs> Fred Sanford said the lights, the, the night lights went out. The night the light the night the lights went out in Georgia. Yeah, that they clicked off because we clicked in a new device. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Graham said, who's denying history? Uh, Mr. Dry Rye is making fun of history as a mere, uh, it's just merely he said, she said. That's all of history, right? So it's all he said, she said. So yeah, that's Mr. Dry Rye there. Um, all right, guys. Oh, sounded good before. Way better. Oh, uh, wait. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> How do we do this? LK Freebie says worse. Macliff says way better. Leona said sounded good before. First last said same. John Joseph said, excellent. Black Angel said, better. Um, audio is fine. Now there's fuzz. Hang on. Is there fuzz now? We know, we know, we know, we know this is, we know this is taking a minute, Just but uh, it's, be it's, bit better, it's so. better to, it's better to handle it at the beginning. Okay. Okay. So we have mic sounds clearer and Fred Sanford said, no, this <clears> is <throat> better. All right. So all of you who hated it have been overruled. All right, so we are going to talk about historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Mike, 
we yesterday we gave us a little introduction we kind of never got back to it you told us how you got in, in, interested in uh, apologetics um, why why did you focus so much on the resurrection yeah so it's my last semester in grad school 1985 the fall semester beginning to question my faith I go into the office of Gary Habermas and he says, look, if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true, right? And I said, yeah. So he focused on some of the evidence for the resurrection. I ended up coming back to that later on for uh, just some writing. It's a co-authored a book with Gary, a popular level book that, um, in fact, you got it right there. It's got a, a CD in it that's good for PCs. I'm sorry, I got a Mac, you have a Mac. It doesn't work in Macs. Um, but it's a simulated television game show with a three-dimensional animated game show host who's Pretty funny, and he helps you master the information One second, in the book. Did, did you turn down the volume? People are saying the volume's lower now. I turned down the gain. All right, how about that? All right. How's that? Is there a volume control on that? Nope. There's no volume control on that? No volume control. I can turn this one up a little bit. Okay. All right, guys. Other than that, we're just going to have to kind of roll with what we got. Um, so anyway, so... Um, I end up doing my doctoral research on the evidence for the resurrection. And what I wanted to do was come at it from a fresh perspective. Um, there had been some work on it from a historical perspective before, um, but no one, according to Gary Habermas, had done a purely historical kind of, you know, let's spell out historical method of philosophy of history and, uh, and take that kind of approach. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the first to take I mean, there had been a handful, but they had been just small treatments. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I had to learn the philosophy of history, historical method. And um, one of the first things I learned was that there's no such thing as an unbiased, completely objective historian. We all have what are called horizons, and that's made up of our, our worldviews, our biases, everything that's uh, um, our our philosophical, our political convictions, the way we were raised, our race, gender, ethics, nationality, um, the, the group of people whose acceptance and respect we desire, all of that feeds into, it's like viewing the world through a pair of glasses and they have a specific tint to them. Mm -hmm. And we all view the world that way. Um, I mentioned in a debate that I had with uh, John Dominic Carlson back in the fall of 2018, the uh, Brett Kavanaugh, Supreme Court justice hearings had just completed. And um, I said, okay, you know, when you look at it, there were a lot of people who were for, uh, they believed uh, Dr. Ford. And there were lots of others who believed Judge Kavanaugh. And it was almost split on party lines. How is it that everybody can look at the same data and come at completely opposite conclusions? Mm -hmm. It's our horizons. It's, it's the way we're inclined. So, and, and most of us don't even realize that's the case. You're not willing to accept that we have our own biases and our own horizons. Uh, we just say that the other person's wrong. And when I came to uh, a study of the resurrection of Jesus, I understood as I was reading philosophers of history and historians that our horizons, the horizon of every historian, um, jeopardizes the integrity of his or her research and so we have to recognize we have it, but there's very few who have even said that there are steps that we can take in order to minimize the, uh, the negative effects of our horizons on our investigation. And so as one who has struggled with doubt over the years, and I have found that this is just part of my personality, it's not just my faith, it's other things that I, I doubt as well, little things to big things. And my wife doesn't like to go shopping with me hates it he's like well should i get this what about that this this you know i, I don't know um and it changed my mind and and stuff so nabil was like that <clears throat> is that right yeah very very picky with lots of stuff and wanted to he would we we would go in a restaurant and he would have to look at every single thing on the menu whereas i would be like oh shepherd's pie i like that yeah i'll take that right where he would he would spend 15 minutes going through every single thing asking about everything because he wanted to order the best possible thing on the menu and it'd be so yeah pretty 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 horrible yeah well so i understand and there's a number of you who are watching this right now um you, you know what i'm talking about it, it's just that way it, this is the way we are wired and so when it comes to something as important 
as eternity, we want to get it right. And so if Christianity is wrong, if it's false, I wanted to know. Now, I didn't want it to be false, but if it's false, I wanted to know. And it didn't matter what it took. If it took God humiliating me, I even prayed, God, I'm engaged in debates with some of these toughest skeptics, non-believers in the world. So if Christianity is wrong, please show me. I don't care if you have to humiliate me, just do it. I want to know truth and follow it. And so my doctoral research turned in to be a lot more involved than typically in doctoral research. You know, you do your dissertation, it's usually 60 to 80,000 words. And to me, at first, that seemed really daunting because to write a 20 page research paper, double spaced with a few footnotes was, was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. But my doctoral dissertation ended up being well over 250,000 words with more than 2,000 and 2,000 footnotes over 500 pages single spaced and they my finally my doctoral supervisor said mike it's time to wrap this thing up i, I could have gone even further to look at some other things but i just wanted to cross every t dot every i and i wanted to do it for me mm -hmm. it started off honestly it started off as an apologetics pro project to prove what i already believed but after about a year into it and it took me five and a half after about a year into it my objectives for doing it changed completely now it was i want to know truth and follow it and i'm going to turn over every stone and i want to know what truth is here even if it's that jesus didn't rise from the dead mm -hmm. and uh so you as you pointed out ended up uh writing this now that you, was before my doctoral work yeah. and this was back you you were putting this together back when me and nabil were hanging out over your house that's right yeah so yeah. The, the mike mike put this together put this book together back then you also put together this was around the same time uh paul meets muhammad in fact nabil read that book i asked him to he's ready to go into uh, uh med school and over the summer he read that book as a muslim mm -hmm. and i said nabil please read this and i i want to i want to know that I have represented Islam correctly, that I haven't you know, created a straw man here. If, if I'm wrong on something the way I portrayed it, please show me. Mm -hmm. And he liked all of it. He thought, mm -hmm. yep, you, you did a good job. You haven't watered down anything. And in fact, one former Muslim said that I presented the arguments stronger than Muslims typically do. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll share this, not too many people know this, but D. James Kennedy, who died several years ago, is a very popular uh, intellectual preacher uh, for Coral Ridge Ministries, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. And um, he read it, he endorsed it. He had me on a show. Now, most of the times he wouldn't actually interview the people. He would have um, one of his, a friend of mine, Jerry Newcomb, do it, and then they would splice him in. But he wanted to interview me personally for this. So I remember when he called, the day he called and I picked up the phone ready for the interview and it was him. And he said, hello, Mike, this is Jim Kennedy. And he had that real majestic voice. I said, well, hi, Dr. Kennedy. And I put my uh, administrative assistant, Jeannie Hope, on the phone because he was a hero for her and she, it just made her year. But he said, Mike, before we get started, I just wanted to say, why did you make Muhammad so persuasive. I have to admit that by the time I finished reading, I couldn't tell who won the debate. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted to make it persuasive. I wanted people to read it and understand here are some of the best Christian arguments, here are the best Muslim arguments out there. Make your own choice. Yeah, that was actually because I read it. I read it before. It was, I read it before it was published. That was actually, you gave it to me to read as well. And I read okay. it. And my... Uh, I remember my, the information is all awesome. It was, it was informa again, information from your, that you, you know, preparing for your debate with, with Shabir Ali. Um, but my criticism was, it sounds like, it sounds like Mike Lacona and it doesn't sound like Muhammad. It sounds like a guy who's way smarter than, Mah <laughs> than Muhammad, right? It sounds like a, a, a guy who's much, much, much sharper than Muhammad. I think Muhammad would have been like, you know, no, I got a revelation. This is what happened. And I'll kill you if you say, call, say I'm wrong. I think that's what Muhammad would uh, would actually be like. But, uh, but now that uh, book's been translated into French and Spanish as well. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, guys. Uh, so as, as far as the books go, um, well, I, I was here and he's got his books on his shelf. So anyway, uh, a good if you're looking for a good 
introductory book on the, the case for the resurrection, case for the resurrection. So historical evidence for the resurrection. Uh, this, this is, uh, so th th this should be on your basic Christian reading list. Uh, the case for the resurrection of Jesus, Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona. Uh, I put the links to these in the description box in case anyone wants to look them up on, on Amazon. But this should be on every Christian's um, reading list. Uh, if you're interested in Muslim arguments, Muslim responses to the resurrection, then uh, you've got this, Paul meets Muhammad, and this is, this is a, a debate about the resurrection. Uh, you also have some bigger works here, some bigger works. So these I would not recommend for everyone, <laughs> not recommend these for everyone, but this one. So this, you can compare, you can compare the, the books here um, in terms of how likely you are to read these. Um, what's this about? Well, that is a slightly uh, revised version of my doctoral dissertation, but it is very readable. So, but it is an academic treatment. Again, it's very, one reviewer said seven, it's a little over 700 pages, said 700 pages read more like 75. So it's, it's uh, gets into a lot more detail, of course, than the other. But if you really want a uh, comprehensive historical case for the resurrection. Like, what is history? How do we do it? What happens when a miracle claim is involved? Does, does that change how historians work? Is it even possible for historians to investigate a miracle claim? Then we look at sources. We do not presuppose that the Bible is divinely inspired, inerrant, or even generally trustworthy. We just look at the sources as a historian would, make no assumptions, and say, you know, what are our best sources to determine what happened to Jesus? And then we mine those sources to say, uh, what from those sources can we prove with reasonable certainty? And, um, and then we take those things, those items that are granted by virtually every scholar who studies the subject, including skeptical ones. And, we, and, that, and that, that would be um, chapter four, and then chapter five, 700 some pages and five chapters, so, and an appendix. But chapter five is taking the most popular hypotheses offered by scholars and assessing them according to strictly controlled historical method in order to arrive at the conclusion, you know, w which one's the best hypothesis. Now, Gary Habermas is the leading um, uh, scholar, foremost authority in the world on the evidence for the resurrection. He knows far more about it than I do, but he says this book right here is the best book on the subject, mm -hmm. as in his opinion. It's been translated into Spanish as well, and um, also Korean. And uh, so here, here's, here's what I would recommend, ladies and gentlemen. Um, again, it, this, this should be in every Christian. Uh, keep in mind, all Christians, Mike is an apologist, I'm an apologist. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do other things. I have a background in philosophy, his background in history and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, apologetics is not just for people who do apologetics, who dedicate their entire life to, to apologetics, right? All Christians are supposed to be apologists to some extent, namely that you are commanded to be able to give a defense for the hope that you have. And that would, that would include the resurrection, wouldn't it? That'd probably be the biggest part yeah. of, our, of our hope. So you as a Christian are commanded to be able to defend uh, that, right? So this would be a good place to go, the case for the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, but as Mike pointed out, this, this one has way more detail to it. So uh, even if you're, uh, I wouldn't, rec I, 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 sorry, but I, I just wouldn't recommend everyone get this and, tr and try to read it all the way through, right? Uh, if you did want to get it, it's good. Uh, I mean, there are people who should read it all the way through, right? I've had high school students yeah. who have read through it. Yeah, there are people who should read all the way through. And these are people who are really, really, really focusing on the resurrection and want to be aware of all the latest research and be aware of all the responses and so on. Uh, but even if, you, if, you, if you're looking at that and going, well, there's no way I'm going to read a 700-page book, uh, you, can, you, you can use this as a reference, right? You can look up particular things, right? Like you can look up, like he'll go, Mike will give, uh, you know, what all of the, all of the, um, main, well, for example, all of the main historical Jesus scholars say about yeah. like Jesus' death by crucifixion and how it's a yeah. certainty and stuff. That can be relevant if you're talking to Muslims and so on. You, you give them a, uh, an idea of what, you know, all, the, all the, the main historical Jesus scholars, even ones who aren't Christians, say about the death of Jesus and so on. Um, yeah. What, what were you saying? Well, there's even some things in there 
uh, when we talk about how to interpret so common objection against the resurrection would be that Paul talked about it being a spiritual resurrection that we're going to have a spiritual resurrection in first Corinthians chapter 15 so I get into that I did original word study where I, I looked at the two Greek terms that are used there it's so in a uh, natural body it's raised a spiritual body in first Corinthians 15 44 and we looked up those two Greek terms for spiritual natural from the 8th century BC through the 3rd century so 11 centuries every occurrence of it I mean there are over a thousand for spiritual and I think there's 800 and, and some for natural and some English translations render that physical so it's so in a physical body it's raised a spiritual body and I show that given every occurrence of those two Greek terms throughout antiquity that to say it's sown a physical body is it's no longer sustainable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, and we talk about various how to translate those and interpret those things properly. Yeah. Um, we, we have a we have a, a couple of questions who are just asking uh, from Michelle and Irene here who are asking what uh, what the title of the book was. Uh, guys, I put the links. I put the links to these books on Amazon in the description box. If you go to the description box, it has all four of the books that we're mentioning here. Uh, this is The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach. But the link to that is in the description box. And one more book, and then we're going to we'll take a couple of questions here because we have uh, some good ones. And then we'll... Uh, I'll, I'll mainly hand it over to Mike for a while. Uh, we'll, we'll, it'll be, you know, I'll, I'll ask questions and stuff, but it'll mainly be Mike presenting um, historical evidence why he believes that the historic why why he believes the historical evidence shows that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, final book here that we would mention: Why are there differences in the Gospels? So, what's this about? I, gu I guess we can gather it from the title. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but so basically, what happens is uh, it it. Um, since the 1970s, back then they started, uh, scholars started, a few scholars started to propose that the Gospels are ancient biographies. And before then, uh, most scholars thought uh, uh, that, that the Gospels were a, a unique literary genre, okay? Um, but then Charles Talbert and some others proposed that they were biographies. David Awney um, got on Charles Talbert and said he was largely wrong in some things, but he gave some other reasons for why he believed the Gospels were ancient biographies. Then along came Richard Burridge, who was trained as a classicist, and he said, this is foolishness. The Gospels are of a unique genre. They're not biographies. And he set out in doctoral research to prove that they were not biographies, and he ended up doing the, the most extensive research on it, and he concluded that well, he was wrong, and that they are ancient biographies. Um, and his book, What Are the Gospels, is one of the most influential books of the 20th century. It was a watershed book. It changed um, virtually single-handedly how New Testament scholars, whether they're liberal, moderate, or conservative, most evangelical New Testament scholars today believe that the Gospels are ancient biographies. And so what does that mean? Because ancient biographies did not... Uh, report. They did not try to report with the same uh, literary conventions that modern biographies do. Um, and they were claimed, this was being claimed, there was some flexibilities in the way we report it. But no one had really done a lot of work on that. Some classicists had for uh, biographies written by Plutarch and Suetonius and so forth, but no one had really done that for the gospel. So I did. I, I stood on the shoulders of, say, Christopher Pelling and some other classicists and and with some compositional devices and i also study the compositional textbooks by people like theon and quintilian Nathonius, and others and saw how people were trained to write back then and paraphrase and narration and say okay if this is what ancient biographers were doing wouldn't we expect the gospel authors to do this too if they are ancient biographers if there were ancient biographies or share much in common with ancient biography and so i read through the Gospels m multiple times in Greek, uh, I think eight times by the time I uh, did this book. And I made a list of all the differences. In Greek. In Greek, right. the original language. And I made a list of all the differences that I found. There were over 50 pages of differences I found uh, that, that I listed of examples. Um, and then I took, you know, some of them could be explained otherwise. I, I mean, they all can be explained otherwise. But I took the 19, <coughs> excuse me, that I believed show the greatest promise of using the compositional devices and techniques described by Theon 
and many of those we can infer uh, being used by Plutarch, Sallust, Suetonius, Tacitus, people like that. And read the gospel differences in view of those. And it's amazing how it sheds light on gospel differences. Uh, I mean, it's just really amazing. Um, Dan Wallace said, how is it that no one thought of this beforehand? I said, I don't know, Dan, it seems so intuitive. Maybe that's why I thought of it because it's so simple. So it's a groundbreaking book. Mm -hmm. um, so really excited about it. It's published through Oxford within four months of publication. Uh, and it was their, one of their best-selling books the, the first year it was out, which was 2017. Within four months, they said, would you write a popular version? Because uh, this one's very academic. Um, and so I, I wasn't going to do that because I already moved on to my next research project was the historical reliability of the Gospels. Um, but as I lecture here in the United States, as I lectured over in Indonesia, I mean, they're just eating it up. Uh, they love this stuff, but there are questions that come up and they say, could you make this in a simpler version? So I've been working on that since, and my next book, which I'm writing this year, will be a popular level, a simpler version of that. Mm -hmm. And right. answer questions like, well, how does this work with divine inspiration, biblical inerrancy, things like that. All right, so um, uh, yeah, all the books that we just mentioned, uh, again, the links are in the description box if you want to check them out on Amazon. Um, Goose 16 asked, is there a book geared towards curious children you could recommend on this subject? Now, you haven't put out any, uh, yeah. any uh, children's books, but I believe, I believe there's... Uh, isn't there like a youth version of Jay Warner Wallace's Cold Case Christianity? I think I there is. I believe so. And there's also youth versions of Lee Strobel's books, The Case for Christ, Case for Faith, etc. Mm -hmm. um, William Lane Craig has some, some books out for children. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, for small children. Um, so... Uh, for yeah, real so, small yeah, children, so it kind of depends on the it kind of depends on the children. So you're going to look at the look at the age. I think the I think the cold case Christianity is for like you know middle school or high schoolers or something like that. But yeah, Craig has some that are like you know cartoon characters, like the bird talks to you know so and so, uh, but actually has you know apologetics and and stuff in there uh, and theology uh, in those books. So it's kind of going to kind of depend on the age. I'll tell you what, the next time I see someone who focuses on this on you know the, the children's books and so on I'll, I'll do a live stream specifically geared towards that because I, I think there are a lot of parents out there who would, who would be interested in that what what books for what kids of what ages and so on so as soon as i get someone who deals a lot with the with the children and youth books and um, stuff like that we'll do that there is a girl her name is elizabeth i believe her last name is urbanovitz um and she deals does apologetics with children. I met her in Chicago at a conference and really a sharp woman mm -hmm. um, and really excited about reaching kids for apologetics. Or Yeah, Elizabeth Urbanowitz, um, U-R-B-A-N-O-W-I-C-Z. -U She's on Facebook and she probably has a, um, a website. I don't know, but you may want to contact her about these things. Mm -hmm. She's Pretty good. Sean McDowell might have some stuff out I for this. I bet Sean would, yeah. Uh, and maybe Brett Kunkel. Mm -hmm. um, Brett, Brett, uh, Brett has an entire ministry geared toward geared towards youth now. So yeah, it's called and, Maven. If you want to check it out. Matter of fact, I should have I should have Brett on a live stream here. Pretty Brett, soon. Brett's amazing. Mm -hmm. And so is Sean. Good Steelers fan too. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not into high school sports. <laughs> What's wrong with you, man? Mm -hmm. uh, Jay Jay Shai, uh, in the super chat said, uh, "I read that book. I think he's talk, uh, talking about the uh, uh, gospel contradiction book." I read that book because I struggled with the empty tomb differences and how huge they were. I struggled extremely until IP, that's Inspiring Philosophy, showed me your book. So, looks like someone read it. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, I, I, cool. I've got a lot of emails that I've collected from people who said they've read the book and it's changed their lives and restored their confidence in the Gospels. Um, because they realize, I mean, these differences actually exist. So, mm -hmm. you have skeptics out there saying these uh, differences uh, call into question the reliability of the Gospels. But if the Gospel authors uh, were writing and using the same kind of literary devices as Plutarch and other folks of that era, then these aren't errors. It's not a sloppy writing of history. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> quick question here, and then we, we actually have a cool one uh, that will lead right into our topic. Um, 
Just curious, how, how would you respond to those who say you are a victim of confirmation bias? Yeah, well, that, that can be said of everybody and their mm -hmm. beliefs, right? And I would say, you know, maybe my earlier days with that, yeah, I probably was a, a victim of that. In fact, not, yeah, very probably a victim of that. But when I did my doctoral dissertation, I mean, nobody needs to believe me on this. I'm not trying to convince you, but I had to, I, I you know, my wife, my closest friends, uh, my doctoral supervisor, uh, Gary Habermas, William Lane Craig, um, I mean, they, the, they can tell you how I wrestled with this and I was willing to go with wherever the evidence uh, went. So I, I wanted to fight confirmation bias and look at the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus as openly, uh, as objectively as possible, because I realized that I really had nothing to fear. Truth is truth. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I would want to know that. Um, if I'm holding on to a stock and that company is going to go belly up and for some reason, let's say I get insider information, I know that stock is going to zero within the next month. Um, but let's say I love that stock and I've held it for years. It's been in the family for years. I'd be stupid to be so emotionally attached to it that I hang on to it. Well, even more so with the worldview. If the worldview of which I presently hold is wrong, if it's false, no matter how much I feel uh, affection for it or want to hold on to it, I would be a fool to hold on to it if it's false. So I wanted to get to the bottom line to see, could the resurrection of Jesus, is it really the best historical explanation? And I was willing to give up my faith, very willing to give it up. And again, those who were closest to me knew the struggle that I was going through. I didn't share it with a whole lot of people during the time. I didn't want their faith to get rocked. But um, you know, those who knew me the close, closest knew uh, how much I was struggling with it. So yeah, I don't think when it came to the resurrection, confirmation bias was, was part of my investigation. Yeah, and I came to believe in the resurrection when I was an atheist. So yeah, um, all right. All right, we have, uh, uh, oh, uh, before, before we go on, uh, a lot of people pointed out, I thought this was the case, but I didn't want to say in case I was wrong. Uh, gain is your volume. That's what oh, they said. They said okay. gain is volume. Well, guys, we're just going to test this real quick for all future reference when Mike, uh, when Mike is doing videos and so on. Let's go ahead and test it right now. Adjust your gain. I'll talk A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, and see how that went way down? Yep. All right, now put it back up to a good rate. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, blah, 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 blah. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, so now Mike learned something. Mike's going to be teaching, but you guys just taught something. Uh, now, I think gain, about... though, if, if I understand it, it's a little more than volume. Isn't it like if the gain is, if I turn the gain down, it, it not only picks up what's in front, but also in the sides, whereas gain kind of focuses to what's immediately in front of it. We'll 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 look it up officially afterwards. Okay. But uh, I mean, you got you got to admit. I mean, that's oh just, yeah, that, that's a shot but that right could now. be because it's focused more on what's in front. Are you a tech guy? I am not. OK, there are several tech I've guys in here. So, yeah, we will, so maybe they could. We uh, will trust them temporarily, but we will in. test it. Speaking of trusting temporarily, but testing things. We have a question about the evidence for Christianity here. <laughs> you see how you see that you see that epic transition, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about technology. We transitioned into the topic. <clears throat> uh, so, hey, David Wood, ex-Muslim here, left Islam a year ago. Congratulations. Uh, however, I'm lost. I don't know if I should follow Christianity or not. If you can, could you prove it for us and me through Jesus' crucifixion? Now, notice this is interesting, right? Because if you're talking about an atheist, the issue is not whether Jesus was crucified, it's whether he, he rose from the dead. Yeah. If you're talking to a Muslim, the issue is not whether he, he, he could rise from the dead. Uh, Islam teaches that Jesus raised people from the dead, and Islam believes in the resurrection and so on. The issue for Muslims is whether he was crucified or not. It's whether he's crucified or not. And here you have an ex-Muslim, and it sounds like he's saying, I mean, he could have just you know, put the wrong word there, and he's actually talking about the resurrection, but he, the, the crucifixion could actually still be the, 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 the point for him, right? He may not believe that Jesus was crucified. He may, he may be completely willing to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, just not, he doesn't believe that he was crucified. So that's a good starting point. Um, Mike, 
why do we believe that Jesus died by crucifixion? And, and by the way, uh, by the way, um, La, I've never seen this name before in my entire life. Laz, Lazarevic, Lazarevic. You tell me if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but Lazar, Lazarevic. Um, if there's anything specific you're focusing on, let us know. But right now, uh, Mike will tell us how we can know historically and I'd be interested in what the uh, perspective of other historians, because we don't just have uh, Christian historians, conservative Christian historians or liberal Christian historians, but we have atheist historians, Jewish, agnostic, Jewish, agnostic all kinds of historians. Um, we don't just want to say, here's what Christians claim. Uh, but give us an idea of, of how we know that Jesus died by crucifixion and what scholars think of this issue. Well, Jesus' death by crucifixion is one of those facts that is agreed upon by virtually 100% of all scholars. In my studies, I looked at what had been written on Jesus' resurrection and you know his death and resurrection since 1985, and I was only able to find probably two... Uh, well, really, only one bona fide scholar within the relevant field, Barbara Tiering, and she suggested that Jesus did not die by crucifixion. He didn't die. He was somehow survived. And um, given like aloe and some uh, kind of herbs within the tomb, and he came out, married Magdalene, and they went off to France or and, somewhere. And, 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 and I, I looked her, I don't remember what I, but when I looked her up, isn't she regarded as like a wacko? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much. She she's not, not highly just, not regarded. Just, not just for that. For 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 other things. But I I don't even remember what the details were. But I just remember look reading some of the stuff she says. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. It's it's. I mean, she's way out there. Um. But everybody, people like John Dominic Crossan, um, who doesn't believe that there was even a creator of the universe, a, a personal being or a god in in the sense that we would think of God, or Bart Ehrman, who is an atheist. Um, they talk about how Jesus' death by crucifixion is one of the most certain facts of the ancient world. Um, I, really, I only found Tyrion as a bona fide scholar within that in, within the field of historians and um, uh, 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 historians of Jesus who would deny Jesus' death by crucifixion. Now, since then, we have uh, Richard Carrier. He's a bona fide historian. He d denies that Jesus ever existed. Mm -hmm. um, and you might find a handful of people like that, but you don't find too many. In fact, the last I heard, there was only like seven or eight people uh, in the bona fide scholars, bona fide scholars in the relevant fields who don't think that Jesus ever existed. So you, out of thousands and thousands of historians and historians of Jesus, you're only really talking about you know, maybe a dozen who would say Jesus didn't die by crucifixion. Um, and there's good reasons to think that Jesus died by crucifixion. You know, one thing is that it, it's reported by early sources. So uh, the Gospels, um, I, I, I like the traditional authorship of the Gospels. Um, but even if you reject that, they're still, they are still four biographies written in the first century within just a few decades of the life of Jesus. And they are independent. There are independent sources. So you have Mark and you have John that talks about his crucifixion. Um, so you have early sources. Um, I would I would claim that John is an eyewitness source, or at minimum, even most scholars would say that John, at least, is based on some eyewitness testimony. And and most scholars today do think that Mark is based on the eyewitness testimony of Peter. That Mark. His primary source was Peter. Then you've got Paul, who's an early source, written writing within only a few, two, three decades of Jesus' death, and he mentions Jesus' death. So you have multiple independent sources, some, um, at least at minimal, some sources rooted in eyewitness testimony, if not eyewitness testimony itself. Um, you've got Josephus, Tacitus, Lucian, Mar Bar Serapian, all of which are non-Christian sources, and they mention Jesus' execution by the Romans. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and someone someone like Paul, someone like Paul, I mean, he's in he's in he's in the correct area for uh, events such as the, the the stoning of Stephen. So mm -hmm. he knows the area. He's against Christianity. So he, oh, he hates he, Christianity. He, yeah, yeah. So he knows this kind of stuff. Now, the point is, he's in the right area to have a good historical mm -hmm. knowledge. Of Jesus, but then even after he becomes a Christian, he knows the apostles, and so if anyone is is in a good position to know whether Jesus died by crucifixion, it's someone like 
uh, Paul. So I would, I mean, if, if Paul was all we had, I'd go with it. But in addition to Paul, we have everything else you just mentioned. You got that? And you got something that um, I've got this in my dissertation, but I, I've never heard it mentioned before. And I would call it the criterion of embarrassment that you've got some embarrassing sources. Now, here's how I, I do this. When you when you look at some of the ancient Jewish martyrdom accounts, mm -hmm. like uh, Maccabee, se 2 Maccabees chapter 7, that talks about the martyrdom of seven Jewish brothers in a very grotesque way. Um, you, you know, they're tortured to death and they're just trash talking the king and saying basically, hey, uh, you know, we're going to get our body parts back in the resurrection. But for you, O king, there will be no resurrection. And then you have rabbis um, who are tortured by the Romans. And just before they die, and some Jews just before they die, they would say, um, God, uh, I have not forsaken your law. And, and um, so anyway, these guys, these uh, in Second Maccabees 7, you know, they're trash talking the king. There will be no resurrection for you, O king. It's kind of like racks and stones may break my bones, but resurrection awaits me. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've got this kind of stuff. Now you come, even in some Christian accounts, like the martyrdom of Stephen, you, you've got some of this in, in Acts and the martyrdom of Polycarp, which happened in the second century. And we have an account of that around the middle of the second century called the martyrdom of Polycarp. Um, some of these, like the martyrdom of Polycarp, is no doubt embellished or amplified um, with, with some details, as is 2 Maccabees and some of the uh, accounts of Jewish martyrs. So when you come to the Gospels, it's really interesting to see that, you know, in the garden, Jesus is really struggling. He's saying, Father, if it's all possible, let this cup pass from me. He wants out if possible. Um, he's not embracing martyrdom. You know, racks and stones may break my bones, but resurrection awaits me. He wants out if possible. And you think about it just a few chapters earlier. He's saying, if you want to be my disciple, you got to be willing to take up your cross and follow me. And here, when Jesus, it's his time to take up his cross, he's wanting out if possible. And then when he's on the cross, he's not saying, God, I've not forsaken your law. He's saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, you know, we don't think about how things like that would have been uh, somewhat of an embarrassing read for the early Christians. Why would you put something like that that is mm -hmm. potentially embarrassing rather than the real hero, tough Mm -hmm. guy that goes without any struggle why would you invent something like mm -hmm. that and put it in uh, so, I, I, yeah. I wanted to comment additionally on the uh on the um the criterion of embarrassment or the principle of embarrassment and then you could talk uh if you if you could talk about how how crucifixion works mm. for people who think well maybe he was crucified someone was asking that yesterday we didn't actually get to it but someone was asking yesterday what about you know muslims who say that so this would be someone like shabir ali who believes he was crucified, nailed mm. on a cross, yeah, but yeah. didn't actually die. So if you could break down how crucifixion works. But uh, uh, along the lines of the, the criterion of embarrassment here, um, just for everyone, because it's such an important principle if you're, if you're studying history. Um, Dariel here said, uh, David, in all seriousness, after your debate with Robert Spencer about did Muhammad exist, is there any evidence outside the Quran that he did exist? Uh, that's going to depend on what you mean by evidence. I would say, yes, we have lots of sources. Um, this is important for the Muslims who are watching that the sources are very late. That's the problem, right? Uh, Mike can confirm if, you, if, you, if you're looking for history, you're looking you know, primarily for early sources, multiple sources, independent sources. So they're not just sources all copying another source because that's actually basically one source. Um, you're looking for that sort of thing. When it comes to Muhammad, we don't have anything like that, right? We have this big, this big empty first century where we have later quotations of stuff that was supposed to be in that first century, but we don't have any. We don't have the first century works. So the the, the earliest sort of detailed biographical work we have on the life of Muhammad is uh, Ibn Asak's Life of Muhammad, and uh, it, it's about it's it's over a century after the time of Muhammad. So that's where things start. But Muslims today tell us don't trust Ibn Asak. He didn't use the the proper hadith methodology. You have to go to uh, works like. Uh, Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim to learn about Muhammad. Well, that's two centuries after the time of Muhammad. So the sources that Muslims tell us to go to to learn about Muhammad are from two centuries after the time of Muhammad. 
Mike, do you use sources from two centuries after the time of Jesus for your for your best historical information about Jesus? No, we're we're only using first century sources. Mm -hmm. So big big difference, big difference. Muslims want to complain. Oh, the Gospel of Mark was written a few decades after the after the time of Jesus. Well, gosh, right? <laughs> if that's your problem, what do you do with Sahih al Bukhari? Why are you pointing to it? It's written centuries after the time of Muhammad. Um, but the question the question is. Uh, is there evidence outside of the Quran that Muhammad existed? Well, yes, I do believe that in these sources like Ibn Asak, written a little over a century after the time of Muhammad, and like Bukhari and uh, Sahih Muslim and so on, I believe that we do have information that's that we can treat as reliable in these sources about Muhammad. But since we don't have the early material, um, since we don't have that, since we don't have early sources, um, I would, uh, you have to apply other principles, right? You have to apply, apply principles like the principle of embarrassment, right? If someone's inventing stories about Muhammad, if someone's inventing stories about Muhammad, um, are they going to invent the kind of stories that we find in the Sirah and in the Hadith? And some of these stories, there just doesn't seem to be any, any reason at all for inventing them. We know they were embarrassing even to the Muslim community because the Muslim community started watering them down almost immediately mm -hmm. and changing them and then eventually deleting them from the from sources like, you know, the, the Hadith collections and so on. So we know they're embarrassing. Why are they putting them in there if they're just making up a historical figure of Muhammad? If they're just making up a guy to start a new religion, to get people to believe in this religion, why are they saying things like, and he accidentally delivered revelations from the devil? Why are they doing that? We know it was embarrassing to them. They keep watering the story down and then they, it's deleted. It's deleted from, from later, later sources. Why would they invent things like that? And so that's the question. So, but that's the principle of embarrassment, right? If you're reading something and someone's, and someone's giving a story, the basic principle, I mean, if you're thinking about like a court case, right? If, you, if someone's on trial and he's on trial for stealing something and you say, hey, we're, did you steal that woman's stuff? And he said, no, I couldn't have been stealing that stuff. I was smoking crack. You might actually, that might actually be a good defense, right? You might, the, 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 the jury might say, well, I mean, you know, if he had said, yeah, I was down at the bingo parlor helping elderly people, you know, they might, no, that sounds like something he'd make up. Who's going to make up, hey, I was smoking crack, right? If, he, if he's trying to be a good guy, trying to get off, uh, trying to get out of a charge or something like that. Well, if, if, if Muslim historians are writing down extremely embarrassing stuff about Muhammad, that tends to weigh in favor of the authenticity. That tends to make us think, well, if they're writing down all this embarrassing stuff about Muhammad, Muhammad's always, you know, he's covered in semen stains and things like that. Uh, Muhammad's telling his followers to, you know, suck on his fingers and Muhammad's sucking on little boys' tongues and all this stuff. If, if they're making this stuff up, why make that stuff up? You could might you might be able you might be able to explain a couple of things and say there's a reason for it, but overall there's so much embarrassing material there that I can only conclude that that this does go back to a historical guy. But when we're talking about Jesus, it's the same thing. If you're inventing if you're inventing things about Jesus, um, you're not going to invent the sort of th the sort of stuff that Mike was talking about, right? If you if you're just free to write whatever you want about Jesus, you're not going to you're not going to write this sort of stuff. And so um, that weighs in favor of the authenticity of the reports. All right, uh, we have uh, just wanted to give a shout out here um, to Stephen Pelton and wait, that's Stephen Pelton. I got two from Stephen Pelton. Oh, he upgraded. Oh, Stephen Pelton joined the uh, the Boom Squad. Anyone wants to join the Boom Squad? It is uh, you're cool. Your level of coolness goes up. <laughs> uh, it's awesome. We we do. Uh, um, I've been a little behind because, as as many of you know who watch my videos about the things going on in life right now, uh, life is kind of hectic uh, given rushing around and you know funeral coming up and things like that. But uh, basically, on the Boom Squad, we uh, we get behind the scene videos. You get uh, 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 sometimes when a uh, early early release of Boom Squad of a uh, of uh, Muhammad's Boom Boom Room videos and stuff. You get them before everyone else and so on. So things like that. <laughs> What's wrong? What are you laughing at? <laughs> I couldn't release. I couldn't release the uh, the Santa Claus one early because I finished it just in time for for Christmas. But uh, other than that, I release some uh, people get certain videos a couple uh, little little early. Um, what is this? Uh, Cheryl R in the super chat said, "Crush the like to share the link." Three, include Act Seventeen apologetics in your questions to Mike and David for a better chance of them being seen. Uh, uh, welcome to the Boom Squad, Stephen Payton. Thank you, uh, thank you, Cheryl. And David Laurel here said, "God saved me from a diabetic coma several times and a couple totaled cars." So that's actually relevant, guys. If you didn't see, if you didn't see yesterday's live stream, uh, it's like an hour and forty-five minutes long. So if you don't want to waste, I mean, if you don't want to waste that time, right? It, because you could be watching new stuff. 
Uh, but if you don't have an hour and 45 minutes to, to spend watching, a, wa watching an, an entire live stream because you have new ones to watch, uh, at least go through to where we're talking about miracles. And you'll see, because I keep posting a bunch of comments down at the bottom, right? And what happened was we're, we're dealing with Hume's objection to, to the possibility of miracles, where Hume said there's uniform human testimony against miracles. And I pointed out that Pew Research uh, shows that there, there are at least hundreds of millions of people who believe they've witnessed miracles in just one Christian denomination uh, in just 10 countries in the world. And so if you, if you sort of do the math, you end up with there are probably over a billion people in the world who believe they've witnessed miracles. And so I just asked the people in the chat, um, how many of you believe that you have actually witnessed a miracle? And it was a ton of people. In fact, when I cut off, after, after I, stopped, I stopped reading, first I was just reading comment after comment after comment. Some of them were specific. Some of them were just saying yes. Um, but after comment after comment, I finally stopped. And then when we were done, I, I kept looking through and it was just way, way more. It was probably two or three times as more as the ones I read. So there are lots of people who believe they've witnessed miracles. And so one of the main objections to miracles and uh, especially towards the resurrection is, well, you know, miracles just don't happen. But people who say that and just dogmatically deny miracles, you have to conclude that, you know, more than a, a let's say a billion people in the world are all wrong about something they believe they've witnessed, right? This is not claiming they're wrong about their political ideology or they're wrong about their religion, right? Everyone believes that tons of people in the world are wrong. They all got it wrong with something they're claiming that they witnessed with their own eyes. And so for you to claim that you know that and that there is universal, uniform testimony, human testimony against miracles ever occurring. When you've got over a billion people in the world, nope, saying, nope, nope, I, I, I've witnessed a miracle. I saw it. I saw it happen. That's, uh, you might want to rethink your methodology there. All right, Mike, well, let's get back to, um, so we got, we, we talked about the principle of embarrassment a bit more, but uh, for Muslims who, like Shabir Ali, um, like lots of Muslims uh, are out there. So just, just so everyone knows that the majority position in Islam is a variation of substitution theory. Someone else was crucified in Jesus' place. Um, the, but there's a minority position that Jesus was crucified, <clears throat> but happened to survive it. So if we know, if we have a bunch of early sources, uh, people who would have known, again, you got the Apostle Paul who knew Jesus' apostles, who, I mean, it was, it was a public event, right? The Jesus crucifixion was a public event. So we know Jesus was crucified. How do we know that he died and didn't actually come down alive? Okay. Well, first of all, all the historical evidence we have would suggest that Jesus died by crucifixion. Even Shabir Ali acknowledges that. All the historical evidence. And even the evidence we have from uh, just the pathological impact of scourging, uh, the tortures that took place prior to crucifixion and, tor and crucifixion itself. I mean, we only have one account fr from antiquity of a person surviving crucifixion. Josephus reports uh, during the Jewish war um, that he saw three of his friends crucified. And he went to his friend, the Roman commander Titus, and asked a favor that he spare the three lives of his friends. Titus, as a favor to Josephus, ordered that all three be removed from their crosses and provided the best medical care Rome had to offer. In spite of this, two of the three still died. So even if Jesus had been removed from his cross prematurely and given medical attention, his chances of survival were still small. So just to be clear, these guys were <clears throat> given. So this is, the, this is the only person we know of in history yep. who survived crucifixion. And it was the Romans intentionally trying, trying right oh, so he's been crucified so he's been whipped he's been he's been put on a cross well, we don't even know yeah. what, what how much you know yeah well, he may not have even been tortured we know that before. he was yeah that we know that yeah. he was crucified so this guy was nailed to a cross three of them <laughs> josephus says hey uh i'm gonna help you out but you gotta you gotta save my friends there they take them down two of them die anyway and one guy survives so Best case scenario, if the Romans are trying their hardest to save a guy who had kind of just been crucified, uh, two out of three, they're not even going to make it. And that's, but that just doesn't seem to be the case with, with Jesus. Yeah, with Jesus. Right? Well, here, here's the thing. We don't have a shred of evidence that Jesus, that they, he was removed while alive or that he was provided any medical care whatsoever, much less Rome's best. So historians have to go with the data. They can't go with wild speculation. I mean, you can, of course, but not sober-minded historical investigation. 
it'd be nice if we could all, you know, go to the past in a time machine and verify our mm -hmm. conclusions, but we can't do that. We have to, it, so the reasonable historian is going to go with the evidence. And since we've got all these reports from ancient sources that Jesus died by crucifixion and nothing to suggest to the contrary, the historian at least must conclude that Jesus was crucified and that the process killed him. But there is one thing, and we discussed this last night in an argument that I uh, call the Islamic Catch-22 argument, and that is we can show that Jesus predicted his imminent death, that it would happen very soon, you know, within that relatively near future, in, in that, you know, with, in, in his lifetime there in the first century, that he would be crucified and killed. So if Jesus wasn't uh, if he didn't die as a result of the crucifixion, then he was a false prophet. In fact, he would say that this had to happen so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. So he is actually teaching in that capacity. And so that would make him a false prophet. Well, the Quran says he's a, a great prophet, right? So in that sense, the Quran would be wrong. But if Jesus um, uh died as he predicted well then the quran would be wrong as well because in surah 4 verses 157 158 it says that god made it appear that way mm -hmm. so either way the quran would be mistaken mm -hmm. on that matter but here's something else uh one other thing and david i heard this from you actually i like this argument and it came from you years ago we can establish that jesus apostles truly believed and were proclaiming that he died and rose from the dead. Now, uh, from what you've told me, from what I've seen, the Quran refers to the disciples, the apostles of Jesus as Muslims. Mm -hmm. So if they're going around, we can understand why God would deceive the Romans, mm -hmm. the Jews who opposed Jesus and had him executed. But why would he deceive his own followers and allow the greatest religion <laughs> The, the most popular religion in the world, even right now, mm -hmm. why would he allow such what Muslims would consider deceit? Why would he allow that to become the most popular, mm -hmm. the biggest religion in the world um, and deceive the disciples? If, and if, if God is willing to deceive Jesus' disciples who are very sincere and whom the Quran refers to as Muslims, how could you even know that he's not deceiving you now? Mm. So it really, to say that Jesus was not crucified has some really terrible ramifications for Muslims. Yeah, uh, and, and it, it, it actually gets worse because the, uh, the, the times in the Quran when, we, when, when Allah says that he's the, the best of deceivers, right? It, it, modern translations will say best of plotters, best of, of planners. I don't care how you translate. If you want to translate as plotters or planners or schemers or something like that, that's fine. As long as you keep in mind that it's the sort of plotting and planning and scheming that has to do with deception. But the times that, this, uh, that Allah brags about being the best of deceivers is connected to two events. One is connected to uh, the, the crucifixion. So um, it's in that context of Jews conspiring to kill Jesus and Allah is, is, better, is better than them. And he actually tricks them into believing that Jesus was crucified when he wasn't. Uh, the other is an incident where uh, Muslims are getting ready for the Battle of Badr. This is in Surah 8 of the Quran. Muslims are getting uh, ready for the Battle of Badr. And Allah gives Muhammad a dream. And the dream tells Muhammad that the the people are approaching with a very small army. It wasn't, it was, the army was three times the size of the Muslim army, right? Mm. But Allah convinces Muhammad through a dream, showing him just a few people coming, that there's just a small army. So Muhammad gets up and says, Allah has revealed to me there's just a small, a small group approaching. So they go out there and they're outnumbered three to one. Um, Fortunately for Muhammad, he guaranteed paradise uh, and, and virgins to anyone who, who you know, turns back and, and actually faces them in battle because they wanted to run. Um, and they, they ended up winning against the Meccans. But that's another context where Allah, I mean, think about this, Allah deceived the Muslims mm. through Muhammad to get them to do what he wanted. And the impact that, that this had on the Muslim community, the early Muslim community, was so profound that Abu Bakr, who was Muhammad's closest companion, he was his father-in-law because Abu Bakr was the father of Aisha, Muhammad's child bride, right? So uh, Abu Bakr, Muhammad's closest companion, he became the first, he's so important that he became the first of the rightly guided caliphs after Muhammad. Um, 
he became the first of the rightly guided caliphs, and he was one of a few people that Muhammad guaranteed would be in paradise. Abu Bakr said, if I had one foot in paradise, I would still fear Allah's deception. Mm. Now think about this. Mm. Think about what Abu Bakr was saying there. If you've been guaranteed paradise by Muhammad, and you say, but even if I had one foot in paradise, I'd still be worrying that Allah's just tricking me and he's about to send me to hell. What are you saying? You're saying, well, yeah, I've been guaranteed a paradise by Muhammad, but how do I know Allah's not deceiving me through Muhammad? Why would you believe that, Abu Bakr? Because he did it before, that's why. Right, so these are guys who are who are who are realizing the kind of the kind of God that they're uh, that they're serving. So disturbing, disturbing stuff. So yeah, that that is a problem that um, that if you want to take the route of uh, you know God tricking people into believing that Jesus crucified when he wasn't, that uh, that has some impacts on uh, impacts on on theology. Um, quick couple comments right here. Uh, Addison Emmett in the super chat says, "Thank you for your videos. They've helped me witness to Muslims. Well, that's why that's why we're here. And by the way, uh, Mike has some some videos dealing with. I mean, he has some debates with Muslims and uh, and videos uh, dealing with people like uh, Zakir Naik and so on. I'm encouraging him to make more because it's just very easy for a historian, someone who spent his life studying this stuff, to take a lecture of Zakir Naik or a lecture of Ahmed Didat and just rip it to pieces. And so it would just be awesome to see a historian responds to Zakir Naik and who, someone who can just quote the sources left and right and can quote various scholars left and right and just, just wreak havoc on that. So. I do have a video out where I, I do play um, Didat mm -hmm. talking about um, the sign of Jonah. Yeah. And then I respond to that and, and show why you know, his interpretation of the sign of Jonah is Absolutely entirely silly. wrong. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's actually good. We might want to, we'll, uh, we'll check that out afterwards because we're going to be linking some of your videos together for, okay. for stuff. Uh, Barbara, uh, uh, Barbara said uh, in the super chat, can't figure out how to give privately blessings to you and your family, David. Thank you, Barbara. And TRB joined the Boom Squad, the greatest group on YouTube. Um, all right, so thanks everyone. And now let's get back to some comments here. This would actually be a little more for Gary, but I happened to actually read the journal article from this when it happened. This was, this was what, 2000, I wanna say 2006 or something when the journal article came out, but uh, just give them real quick, give them Gary's background when it comes to the Shroud of Turin. Well, Gary, uh, what, Gary knew some of the members of the STIRP team, the Shroud of Turin research project that in the 1970s actually worked on the Shroud of Turin. These were scientists, most of them were not believers, and they thought they were just gonna go in and, and uh, disprove the Shroud of Turin and show it as a forgery. When yeah, they, they, yeah, he said they, they thought they were gonna walk in there and see paintbrush strokes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And then they later on, uh, some of them became Christian because they had no explanation. They knew it wasn't a forgery. In fact, uh, I, Barry Schwartz is, was the official uh, Sturp photographer. He's Jewish. He is not a Christian. But he said the evidence for the Shroud of Turin, its authenticity, is so strong and compelling, he believes that it's probably the burial shroud of, of Jesus and that the resurrection caused the resurrection of Jesus caused the image on the shroud. Now he says he's not certain of it, but he says he thinks that that is his, uh, that's the best guess, uh, his best guess. And he's looked at the evidence and he said that the carbon dating testing it was, was, was flawed, seriously flawed. He just wrote an article about it. It's embarrassing to those who did the carbon 14 testing back in the eighties. Um, and it's going to be published in a fest shrift for Gary Habermas. That's coming out uh, probably this fall. It will debut, and he's got a, a dynamite article in there about the Shroud of mm -hmm. Turin. Yeah. So um, the basically for those of you who aren't familiar with it, you can look it up. The Shroud of Turin is a is a big cloth that uh, if you look at it, it just looks like some 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 smudges on on a cloth. People didn't realize until they were photographing it that when you look at the photographic negative, it looks like a picture. It looks like a picture of Jesus. So um, this thing has, you know, been examined uh, a lot. And so it, all kinds of interesting stuff, like there's rock dust that goes back to the area around Jerusalem and- um, Pollen. The, yeah, uh, pollen. And there's all kinds of evidence that ties it uh, to first century- and, and things that would have never been thought of by a forger. Mm -hmm. And it's like what Gary is fond of saying, if the Shroud of Turin is authentic, we actually have a photograph of the resurrection. Yeah. 
And, and if we don't, it's the greatest forgery ever because it, it, there, there are other things like there's a there's a cloth known as uh, uh, the Sudarian, is mm -hmm. that, and that goes back at least to the sixth century. Yep. But the blood stains on the blood pattern stains of, of the head wounds on the shroud actually line up. They match up with uh, the Sudarian, which is like a head cloth, just a head cloth. Um, so there's very interesting stuff going on. But but so a bunch of researchers actually ex examined this. They thought it was going to be an obvious uh, fraud when they examined it. Uh, they, the vast, the majority of them walked away saying, no, this thing is real. But then it was carbon dated and the carbon dating said that this was uh, like Middle Ages. And so for many people, many people concluded, ah, it's, it, it must be a fake then. But lots of people were concerned because the other people were, the people who actually studied it were saying, no, there's gotta be something wrong here because we, I mean, all the evidence, all the other evidence points in, points in a different direction. So uh, if you're talking about, um, uh, a study it was in I think 2006 or something like that but it was in the the, the, the science journal uh, Thermochemica Acta and the guy did they basically took pieces of the corner to do their carbon dating right they took pieces of the corners of the shroud uh, but he uh, a researcher argued because he tested the cloth and he concluded that the cloth from the corners was not part of the original shroud the shroud had at one time been in a fire and parts of it were burned off and so they they in order to hold on to it they replaced parts that had been burned off so that people could 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 hold it and it would be a uh, a full shroud and so he was suggesting he said you have to get some of the some of the the, the middle parts um, and he said you don't need it you don't need to destroy it. you don't need to cut a part out you can just take some of the threads that are fraying and stuff and you can get enough to do a to do a uh, a test but as far as the question here do you think uh, the scientists when testing the shroud uh, purposely took took from places where the shroud was repaired later mm -hmm. uh, no I don't believe it was they purposely were trying to get a misread um, or, or, or a later reading. You know, there was a I think, debate, that a, he, a heated debate that took place. Some people wanted to take it from other parts of the shroud where <coughs> um, it would seem to be a lot, uh, they'd get a lot more accurate reading. The problem is that it used to be displayed publicly every year and people were holding it. So you've got bacteria on there and polymers from all that public hand, hand, mm -hmm. handling that happened over mm -hmm. the years. And even the guy that invented carbon-14 dating, who does not think that the shroud is authentic, he said that the polymers on there that uh, uh, built up over all those centuries from public handling um, would would make it so that we can't be certain that the carbon-14 dating was correct. And when he said this in the 90s, he said that even then they did not have the, the technology available to clean that off mm -hmm. to ensure an accurate dating. So what happened was they, a lot of the team members wanted to take from a better part of the shroud, but others said, no, let's take from the ends. Um, and they said, no, not from the ends, because that may not give us an accurate reading, but that's what they ended up doing. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't intentional. There was hot debate that took place over mm -hmm. this. Yeah, and uh, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the situation is kind of there are there were lots of people, lots of uh, lots of people in the church who didn't want you touching the shroud, right. right? They don't want you. They don't want you cutting the shroud up. Because once um, you cut it up, I mean, it's you take that part off, you can't put it back. Yeah, and so the idea is at the end of the day, well, okay, the corner, the very corners, at least you're not anywhere close to the image. Uh, so that that seems to be the basis for for going to the corners. So it doesn't seem to be any deception involved. Um, just seems to be they went with the corners. Problem is the corners were apparently rewoven into the fabric after parts were burned off in a fire. So if we want an accurate date of the shroud, we need to need to get a, a better source for the for the fibers or come up with some sort of um, uh, alternative dating method. Yeah. yeah. All right. So By the way, I saw a thing pop up that I translate the book to Indonesian and. Yes, the book, The Case for the Resurrection you of Jesus. You translated no, it? Come on, you don't know Indonesian. But that book, not the CD that's included in it, but the book itself was translated into Indonesian. And if you, um, I, I can put you in touch with the person who could could lead you to where to get a copy of that book if they still have some. I don't know how many copies of it they made. You can probably make some more copies um, but I can get that information mm -hmm. to David if you contact him. So that was from RD in the Super Chat. Um, here's a question that's slightly off topic, but it, it allows you to, to go into a little more detail on, uh, on how history works. 
so LJ says, uh, Mike Lacona, do the other resurrections mentioned in Matthew 27 stand up to the same scrutiny compared to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Now, now, now two things I see. These aren't resurrections in the same sense that Jesus was resurrected. Uh, two, I would say, no, you're talking about you're talking about one source there, whereas you have a bunch of sources for the resurrection of Jesus. But but what are your thoughts on whether um, the the other people who are raised uh, in Matthew, do they stand up to the same scrutiny as the resurrection of Jesus? Yeah, no, they, they don't. That that is the only re time it's reported in the Gospels. We probably have an allusion to it in the writings of uh, Ignatius in the early second century. But even most of the early church fathers don't mention them. Um, you do have Origen in the early third century mentions them, but says that these weren't resurrected and came back to life on earth. They they went to the holy city and appeared to others in the holy city, and it's referring to the uh, 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 the holy city in heaven, Jerusalem in heaven. So um, my take on that is one that's shared by many New Testament scholars, gospel scholars, and that is when you look through the ancient literature, you find that. Um, there, are, there are what are called portents. These are invented uh, uh, details that are meant to, um, it's kind of like what we would say today, it rained cats and dogs, or 9-11 was an earth-shaking event. Uh, we don't really mean that there was an earthquake on that day. We don't really mean that cats and dogs rained from heaven. But they had some things like this back then. And um, sometimes... They would commingle things like this, apparitions, and uh, they would commingle it with actual historical events, which makes it difficult for us when we're doing historical investigation to distinguish between them. So my friend John Ramsey, a retired classicist from the University of Illinois in Chicago, uh, back in, I think it was 2007, came out with a book. It was a catalog of comets mentioned in the Greco-Roman literature from, I think, the 4th century BC through the 3rd century every time a comet was mentioned. And so he provides the original uh, language and then the English translation. And you, we can verify in some cases that a comet appeared, uh, like the Halley's Comet or the hale -Bopp Comet uh, or a different comet, that it was actually around at that time. Josephus mentions that there was a comet um, that appeared when the temple was destroyed. So we find these things, but sometimes in these reports, it also mentions an eclipse of the sun. Um, so like when Julius Caesar was assassinated, you've got a number of authors who mentioned an eclipse of the sun or a comet. Um, but you also have Livy in the, in the first century who would say that um, other portents happened, like streams stopped flowing, black intestines were seen outside of animals, pale phantoms were seen walking around at sunset and all kinds of things like this. Fighting was seen in the heavens and weapons fell out of the heavens. Um, you find this in other Greco-Roman and Jewish literature. What's really interesting is you can look and you can find, we can know that some, in some case, sometimes there was a comet that actually appeared on these various occasions in which it was reported. But there's also a website that NASA has where you can enter a year and select a geographical region and it will tell you whether an eclipse of the sun was visible in that region that year. And we can confirm on occasion that there was a comet but there was no eclipse, which means that that particular author commingled actual event with a portent in order to highlight and dramatize what was going on. So it does make you wonder when it talks about pale, phantom, pale phantoms seen walking around at sunset, and these are found in other sources as well, uh, uh, important events like when Caesar enslaves Egypt and things like this. It makes you wonder if Matthew is doing the same thing um, and commingling some importance with actual historical events like this. Um, you do have, there are some theological challenges. So um, or if it's a resurrection, are they raised in a, in a resurrection body never to die again? Well, in that case, they would contradict uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, verses, verse 20, which says that Christ is the first fruits of those who sleep. He's the first to be raised with a resurrection body. So you say, okay, well, maybe they were raised in the same kind of body like Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, and the widow's son, uh, same kind of mortal body in which they died only to get sick and die again. Okay, so now they're raised uh, from the dead when Jesus dies around 3 p.m. on Friday, 
but they don't come out of their tombs until um, after the resurrection, which is no less than 40 hours later. So what are they doing in the meantime, had you been there? Would you have seen them pacing back and forth? Uh, where they've been talking to one another. Um, they come out of their, their, their tombs later after Jesus has been raised. They go into the city. Now they haven't eaten for a couple of days. They haven't drank anything. They're thirsty. They're hungry. They're homeless. They've got some really interesting stories now because they talked about them being many of the saints were raised. So they got some real interesting near-death experiences. Why is it we don't hear about these guys again? You, you'd think we, we would, but we really don't find any kind of detailed reports about them. So it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. I tend to think that it's it's important, and, and Matthew didn't intend for us to interpret it in a historical sense. Mm -hmm. Of course, it may be um, that they were actually raised, but Matthew would be the only real source, early source, who had mentions it, and we just have to say, well, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, maybe it wasn't meant to be interpreted that way. Certainly, though, we don't have the same sort of, of evidence mm -hmm. in terms of strength, quality, or quantity that we have for the resurrection of Jesus. And let me add one more thing, because this is important. Someone might say, okay, well, if, if they didn't mean that, well, we've got reports of other people who died and came back from the life in antiquity, a few that predate Jesus, too. So how do we know the resurrection of Jesus wasn't the same kind of stuff? if that's what Matthew does with the race saints. That's easy. The earliest Christians truly believe that Jesus rose and appeared to them. Our earliest report comes from Paul. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he bases the hope of, of, of our life in heaven on the actual historical resurrection of Jesus. Christ is the first fruits. And then in verse 23 of chapter 15, um, each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. after that, those who belong to him at his coming. And then later on in the chapter, chapter 15, he talks about, you know, why I, I, I had to fight the wild beast in Ephesus. We face the possibility of death daily. You face persecution on a regular basis. Why do this if we aren't going to be raised? And the only way we know we can be raised is because Christ is raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Those who've died as believers are forever lost. And Paul goes on and he says, so let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. If Christ was not raised, the dead aren't going to be raised. The Christian life isn't worth living. So let's party, do everything you want to do. Don't worry about sin. There's nobody who's going to hold you accountable for it in the afterlife. Enjoy your life now to its utmost because this is it. But Paul turns around and he says, but Christ was raised, therefore we will be raised, therefore the Christian life is worth living. And that argument of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 makes absolutely no sense if the resurrection of Jesus was not meant and communicated and proclaimed as an event that occurred in history. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, on on the issue on the issue of uh, <clears throat> of other people being raised uh, at that time, um, it, it's it's already been pointed out. The, the question was, well, what about you know what about someone like like Re Lazarus? Mm -hmm. These aren't that's not a resurrection, right? What would you call that? A, a revivification the, or the a, actual word a in Greek or something? There's two Greek words for this: agero and anastasis. And that's also used for the same kind of thing mm -hmm. of Lazarus. So the only difference is context. Mm -hmm. All right. And it's just context. So, but yes, we would distinguish from that and call it a resuscitation because mm -hmm. Lazarus would come back in the same kind of mortal body only to die again. He would die again to, when he got old. Exactly. If he didn't get sick or something. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus not. You know, he, according to the Gospels, he could pass through walls, appear and disappear at will. Uh, Paul talks about he distinguishes our mortal bodies with resurrection bodies excuse me, resurrection bodies in 1 Corinthians 15. It's sown an, an, um, a weak body. It's raised a powerful, glorious mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. You know, things like this. Yeah. So the, the, the issue in, that's, that's brought up in, in Matthew 27, where you have these other people um, being raised, is the, 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 the main issue is just that, that why, the main question is why is Matthew the only one who reports it? So the question is, what is, is Matthew doing something different 
uh, with the text? Is he using a literary device or something like that? I don't believe that that is uh, that that is authentic. That people were actually raised. I believe these would have been some, uh, you know, some local people from that area who uh, had believed him and believed in him and maybe died before then. But the, the, I mean, if people recognized them as people who had been dead, then it would have been people who who died recently. Uh, but if the question was, so since the question was. Um, do we have the same kind of evidence for the that we have for the resurrection of Jesus? I mean, obviously not. Uh, you know, as Mike pointed out, you know, this is this is the foundation of Christianity. We have lots of sources for the resurrection. For Matthew, we have we have uh, we have that source, and then maybe maybe uh, uh, a mention of it or or an allusion to it. Uh, later on. So just not a lot. And here we're talking about, you know, from the perspective of a historian, if you were a historian evaluating this, then you, you just have much stronger evidence for the resurrection than you have for something that's only reported in one source. Um, here, uh, matter of fact, before we go on, before we go on to some more questions, well, we have a, a comment here. Uh, this kind of supports what, what you were saying. Uh, the New Testament wouldn't be written if Jesus wasn't resurrected. Uh, it's from Abdu in the in the super chat that yeah to to get to get Christianity started and to form that kind of basis for their thoughts and beliefs, uh, you kind of need something like the resurrection to to get that off the ground. All right, uh, we have uh, I have another cool comment here that I wanted to get to. We also wanted to get to the actual resurrection because we spent a lot of time on the crucifixion. Uh, but just before we move on, uh, give us a little more on the perspective of. Uh, let's say people like Bart Ehrman and John Dominic Crossan, all these guys. Uh, where do they where do they put the crucifixion? Is it something where yeah we we can kind of believe in that maybe Christians are right, or is this historical fact for them? Oh well, both Crossan and Ehrman would say it's one of the most certain facts of the ancient world mm -hmm. based on the evidence that we have. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, so just keep in mind, everyone, uh, the atheists and agnostic scholars, uh, New Testament scholars, historical Jesus scholars uh, say it's a, it's, a, it's a historical fact or it's one of the best established facts of, of history. And so, guys, if you're going against the crucifixion, if the crucifixion is your objection, as it would be for many Muslims, if you, you're putting your confidence in, it's just funny that if you're putting yourself, if you're putting your confidence in the Quran and the Quran denying the crucifixion, or you're putting your confidence going against all of history and a God who claims that the reason people believe that Jesus died was because he's such a great deceiver. And you have to believe that when he says that Jesus wasn't crucified, that he's not lying to you then, even though he admits that he deceives people for no reason. And then on top of all of that, he's a God who tells you that Christian, he tells Christians that they have to judge by the gospel when the gospel affirms that Jesus died by crucifixion. And on top of all of that, he says that he preserved and protected the true Christians until they became uppermost. And even Muslim commentators, if you go to Yusuf Ali's commentary, even, even Muslim commentators say that this referred to Christianity taking over the Roman Empire. And we know what those Christians believe. They believed in Jesus' crucifixion. So Allah affirms those as the true Christians. So he had to help. He calls those the true Christians when according to Muslims today, they would be false Christians. I, guys, you can't make sense of this. You can't make sense of this because that's just what happens when a seventh century illiterate caravan robber who doesn't know anything about history takes a bunch of stories and, and puts them together in the Quran. You get, you get this sort of incoherent, uh, incoherent nonsense. Um, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll take uh, two questions right here because this will kind of lead in. Um, this is from Jay Shai in the, in the super chat. He says, uh, what do you say to an atheist who says that Jesus was likely thrown into a mass grave as it was the norm, according to Josephus, uh, they say the Bible is all uh, claims. So I guess the first part is that is the real question. So if someone says, and, and by the way, this would be certain people in the Jesus seminar and so on. I said, ah, most likely he would have just been, you know, tossed into a, a shallow grave or something like this or mass grave and eaten by dogs, maybe. Yeah. So what do you think? Well, um, it is true that that was typically the, um, that was the typical practice of the Romans to do that. However, it was also standard practice of the Romans that when they conquered a people, they allowed them to keep most of their customs. And one of the customs of the Jews was that they had to bury the executed prior to sunset. And so we find something like, not only do we find it multiply attested in the Gospels, that the Jewish leaders who asked Jesus to be uh, removed and buried prior to sunset. They asked Pilate to, to remove and bury him prior to sunset. We find that in Mark and in John, which is multiple independent sources, uh, scholars would give that. Um, but 
Josephus mentions in his Jewish War, Book 4, Section 317, he talks about that um, in the war with the Jews, the Romans had hired some mercenaries who came into Jerusalem a few years, be just a couple of years before the temple was destroyed. And Josephus reports that they killed a bunch of Jews and that they refused to allow the, those Jews to, to receive a proper burial. Um, and the Jews were incensed over this. And Josephus says, because prior to this, the Romans allowed the Jews to remove the crucified and the condemned and to give them a proper burial prior to sunset. So we do have Josephus, the Jewish historian, not a Christian, who testifies that prior to these couple of years to uh, prior to the destruction of Jerusalem temple. So the temple is destroyed in the year 70. So we're probably looking at the year 67, 68, in which this occurred. And Josephus is saying prior to 67, 68, the Romans allowed the Jews to remove the crucified and to bury them prior to sunset, that this was the practice in Jerusalem. And um, we also have uh, archaeological evidence that was uh, discovered in the 1960s in Jerusalem of a guy named Yehohanan who still had a nail from crucifixion embedded in his ankle. And it was found in an ossuary. An ossuary is a bone box. And what would happen is they would bury Jews in Jerusalem. Um, they would bury them and they'd come back a year later. And at that point, the body had decomposed. They would collect the bones, and then they'd put them in this box, this um, stone box, which is about two feet long, a foot and a half high, a foot and a half wide. And we, and saw, we they, saw these all over the place on uh, in, the Mount of Olives. And that's stuff. right. Yeah, these Near Gethsemane. Were all over the place. Yeah. I got photos of them, lots mm -hmm. of them. They found well over a thousand of these things that they have found already. And so in the 1960s, oh, by the way, they had these. They started using these around 30 BC, and they stopped around 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Mm -hmm. So there's about a, only about a hundred years in which these ossuaries were used. And it's during that time, no later than the year 70, mm -hmm. that you find the bones of a crucified victim, Yehohanan, in yeah. Jerusalem, and he had received a proper burial. So the being buried in a shallow pit for dogs to, to feed on the carcasses, that was something that was practiced by the Romans, but not in Jerusalem. And so the, the so we know, so basically we know, yeah, this is how the Romans tend to dispose of crucifixion victims, but we also know that there were exceptions to this. And this would have been someone who's calling in a favor or has his, you know, his family says, Hey, we wanna we wanna get this body. We know that but even were, apart from that, yeah. he would have still received a proper burial mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but but we know specifically with with a crucifixion victim that you, you you can't say they were all just thrown into graves and eaten by dogs and not buried and stuff like that. We know that they would actually have been 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 through that entire process of being buried and then waiting for his flesh to come off and then right uh, in Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem was an exception. Not only do we have Josephus, a non-Christian Jewish author, writing this historian. But we also have archaeological evidence from Jerusalem that this was a practice. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, moving on to the resurrection, because we do need to be wrapping up pretty soon. This, uh, this has flown by, but we've already been going uh, an hour and a half now. Uh, Donna ne uh, Nassim said, since we have enough evidence to prove Jesus resurrected, how come we have so many people who don't believe in Jesus at all, many who became atheists? Before we get to... The second part of her question, namely, what, why are there so many people who, um, you know, who don't believe or who don't believe that Jesus existed and things like that? Why are there so many people who reject it uh, if we can prove it? Uh, first of all, how would how, how do we know that this person who died and died as a fact of history and uh, died so much so that even scholars who will reject all kinds of other things about Jesus acknowledge that this is one of the best established facts of history. How do we know that this guy who died didn't stay dead? Well, we would approach it the same way we would as the, the crucifixion of Jesus. What evidence do we have that he was alive afterward? Um, so for that, we have multiple sources. Um, uh, so for example, you've got Paul, he's early. In fact, he was a non-Christian. 
he, he was not only just a non-Christian, he hated Christianity. He believed Jesus was a failed Messiah, a false prophet. And so Jesus would have been the last person in the universe that Paul would have expected to see or wanted to see. He was out persecuting the church because he believed, he believed it was God's will that this cult, a uh, Jewish cult, be destroyed. And then he had an experience that he was persuaded was the risen Jesus appearing to him, and it radically transformed his life from being a persecutor of the church to one of its most able defenders. And so we have to explain what led Paul to this belief. It, he had an experience, and virtually all scholars acknowledge that he had an experience that led him to believe Jesus had risen and had appeared to him. So what was that? You know, you could say it's a hallucination, or you have to be able to account for what changed his views. And then uh, Paul met with the Jerusalem apostles, and we have really good evidence that they're proclaiming the same thing that Paul is proclaiming. We get this from Galatians 1, Galatians 2. You get it from the Gospels. You get it from the book of Acts. Um, but even just from Paul's writings, you have it from Galatians 1 and 2. You've got it from 1 Corinthians 15 when Paul gives an oral tradition that he received from the apostles. I delivered to you from what I, at the, at the very first, what I also received. And there's every reason to believe that Paul got this from the Jerusalem leadership, um, the headquarters, and from the apostol uh, apostolic authorities there. So um, Paul says he brought it before the, the uh, apostles, the gospel message he was proclaiming, which included the resurrection. They approved what he was pr proclaiming to be uh, on message to what they were proclaiming. And in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, whether I or they, the apostles, this is what we preach. This, this is what you believed. Um, you've got Polycarp, who is probably a disciple of the Apostle John, saying that Paul accurately and reliably proclaimed the message of truth. You have Clement of Rome, who is probably a disciple of the Apostle Peter, who places Paul on par with his uh, mentor Peter. Um, so we, we've got some really good reason to think that the apostles are proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. There, we have numerous ancient sources, uh, like you've got Luke, Tertullian, uh, John, um, Dionysus of Corinth, Origen, Polycarp, Ignatius, and Clement of Rome, who mention how the disciples were willing to suffer and willing to die for their gospel proclamation that included Jesus' resurrection. Liars make poor martyrs. So we can establish that the disciples were not only proclaiming that Jesus rose from the dead, we can also establish that they truly believed it. So not only Paul, but also the apostles, Jesus' followers, you've got to explain why they are truly believing that Jesus rose from the dead and had appeared to them in individual and in group settings to friend and foe alike. The group appearances really challenge hallucinations because hallucinations um, are, are experiences that occur. They're false sensory perceptions in the mind of an individual. They have no external referent. So they're like dreams. I couldn't wake up my wife in the middle of the night and say, honey, I'm having a dream. I'm in Maui. Go back to sleep. Join me in my dream and let's have a free vacation. Uh, we might both dream we're in Maui, but we're not going to have the same dream. Um, because we can't participate in the same dream. Hallucinations aren't collective. They're not contagious. So um, the group appearances are problematic. The appearance to Paul is problematic. The fact that all of these, they're saying, appeared, that talks about a visual experience. But yet all the kind of reports that we have from mental professionals over the last more than a century tell us that only about 7% of those most likely to experience a hallucination actually experience a visual hallucination. And yet this would require that 100% of Jesus' disciples experienced a visual hallucination of Jesus, did so in group settings, and that Paul, very unlikely to experience a hallucination of the risen Jesus, he also experiences a visual hallucination of him. And by the way, so did James' skeptical brother, uh, uh, Jesus' skeptical brother, James. He would have experienced a visual hallucination of Jesus. And you put all these together and you just compound the improbabilities. So the, and, and if you do grant the empty tomb, it's not granted by all scholars, but somewhere between two thirds to three quarters would say Jesus' tomb was empty. Certainly hallucinations wouldn't account for an empty tomb. 
But even if you don't include the empty tomb, you've got multiple problems. And hallucinations don't lead you to believe that a person was raised bodily, physically from the dead. Um, it only would lead you to believe that they were exalt you saw them spiritually in some sense. Um, so there's all sorts of problems with the hallucination hypothesis. The best uh, hypothesis, the only one that is able to account for all of the historical bedrock, that is fact so strongly evidence that even the majority nearly unanimous consensus of a heterogeneous consensus of scholars grant them as facts. The resurrection hypothesis is the only hypothesis that can do that mm -hmm. by far. There's not even a close second place. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, in short, right? In, in, in short here, uh, we know that Jesus died. We know that his followers afterwards were claiming that he had appeared to them alive again, risen from the dead. And, and by the way, they really believed it. And by the way, that second part, that the disciples were convinced that Jesus had appeared to them. That's also affirmed by, even by atheist scholars, agnostic oh, yeah. scholars, and so Virtually on. Virtually 100% mm -hmm. agree with that. Yeah, so these are basic, these are historical facts, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus' death by crucifixion is a historical fact. It's a historical fact that his disciples were convinced that he had appeared to them afterwards. So scholars mm -hmm. will grant both of those as facts but they obviously don't want to believe in a miracle. They don't want to believe that a miracle occurred, so they have to explain the facts some other way. So they don't need, there, there's no real explaining away uh, Jesus' death, they'll grant that. Um, but they have to explain how the disciples came to believe that Jesus had appeared to them. And some of the traditional ones were hallucinations. It's, it's also common nowadays. That's the most popular yeah, one. It's, it's also now, it's also common, isn't it becoming common to just say, I don't know. Yeah, that, I don't know what happened. Some some would say that. I don't know how common it is, but some would say that. Um, but it, yeah, it's probably more now than it has been in the past. And I, I would say that that is really, if I, if I were going to be a skeptic, that would be what I would hold. I think that's the only reasonable position that a skeptic could hold. Say, look, just not enough evidence for me. It's, it doesn't convince me. So hallucinations doesn't make sense to me either disciples lie doesn't make sense to me either i don't know what happened i don't think it was a resurrection but i can't explain it mm -hmm. here hey here we have jonathan mann real quick uh you know jonathan Remember oh jonathan? man yeah. hey jonathan yeah, we know what jonathan. a great guy yeah uh he's gonna be he's gonna be the next michael brown mm. him and him he's and, sharp yeah, him uh, and yeah, eric yeah him and his buddy uh him and his buddies are messianic jews and they're they're training to uh they're awesome th there's kind of michael brown and then no one else who's like huge right so they're gonna they're gonna step up uh but he said um, how would you respond to a supernatural objection paul's experience was an encounter with a demon mm -hmm. Right, because we because there are people who would say that Muhammad encountered a demon and yep. then helped him start a false religion and so on. So, what would you think there? Well, of course, there is a difference. Muhammad, according to our earliest Islamic sources, say that Muhammad himself believed that it was a demon that That's he was true. encountering. That's true. That's true. Right? Mm -hmm. You don't have that with Paul. Mm -hmm. um, plus, you don't really have an external source with Muhammad, someone else who saw the angel Gabriel mm -hmm. who testified you do have all these other disciples of Jesus. So maybe you could say, well, demons completely deceived not only Paul, but also the disciples of Jesus. But then what do you do with Jesus, uh, um, you know, predicting his imminent death and resurrection? Now, yeah, if you, you're a Muslim saying that it was a demon that appeared to Paul, what do you do with the apostles? And then what do you do with... Um, uh, the fact that Jesus did predict his imminent death and resurrection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you want to go the demon route, it, it's not just Paul, it's Paul and all of his followers and Jesus, and you basically have to be saying everyone, uh, everyone in the first century was just uh, running around possessed by demons. Uh, so you could go that route, but then you'd be, yeah, it's uh, going to be kind of weird to spread it, spread around the, the demon, the demon uh, theory that, that wide. Um, so Donna here, so basically, uh, going back to, going back to the, the claims, the, the, the basic idea, because we want the, the nutshell version. Um, Jesus died. We know it. It's a historical fact. It was a public event. Everyone knew it. That's how it was. Um, later, his disciples were going out and claiming that they had witnessed him. But it's not just people who believed in him. It's, a, it's an, his initial followers, as well as his brother James, and along with his other brothers, but specifically James, uh, Jesus was said to have appeared to him. 
Um, so J so Jesus supposedly appeared to James and uh, and again, G Jesus brother James didn't believe in him during his lifetime. He thought there was something wrong with him. All of a sudden he goes out and he goes to his death. He goes to his execution, proclaiming Jesus as Lord. And the Apostle Paul, who was such an opponent of Christianity, he tried to destroy the church. All of these people supposedly um, witnessed Jesus risen from the dead and appearing to them. That's what you look at as the historical evidence. The question is, how do you explain that? As Mike pointed out, if you want to say hallucination, wow, that's a lot of a lot of hallucinating. That's almost along the lines of saying they're all, you know, they're all demon possessed, right? For saying all these guys in all these different situations over all this time were all hallucinating, seeing the same guy. That is some wild, wild stuff going on. So the question is, um, the, I think that because the question here is, since we don't have enough evidence to prove Jesus resurrected. No, since we since have we enough, have enough evidence. Uh, evidence to prove Jesus resurrected, how come we have so many people who don't believe in Jesus at all? Many who became atheists. Um, so the question is, why don't people believe it? Well, notice, notice. The evidence isn't changed. There, there are tons of people, and usually this is the case with atheists, they don't know about the historical evidence, right? That's why they'll conclude things like Jesus, you know, Jesus didn't exist, right? Most, most atheists are not familiar with the historical evidence. Most atheists have not studied the historical evidence. Um, but even among, even there are plenty of atheists who have studied the historical evidence, but notice they're dealing with the same facts if they actually take facts seriously. Um, the question is, what sort of explanation are you willing to accept? Because keep in mind, uh, w human beings, we can adjust our level of, of skepticism to believe what we, what we want to believe, right? I, I, I can adjust my level of skepticism if I don't want to believe in you, Donna. If I don't want to believe that Donna Nassim exists, I can explain away your existence. I can conclude that you don't exist. I can conclude that this is a, uh, you know, a sort of a online bot who sends out this comment, or it's someone masquerading as you, uh, or uh, that, a, that a demon <laughs> posted this, or that an alien did it, or that I'm dreaming right now. I can explain anything away that I, that I don't want to believe. Um, this goes, I think this goes back a lot to what, what Mike's talking about with horizons and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, what, what, what is acceptable to you as a thing? Obviously, if you're ruling out the supernatural, if you're ruling out miracles, it doesn't matter what the evidence is. You've already, you've already ruled that out. Um, so the question, I think, comes down to us, right? Uh, if God gives us a miracle, keep in mind, God could raise the dead right in front of an atheist. That doesn't mean the atheist is going to believe. In fact, Mike, didn't Matt Dillahunty actually say that, that if he if he if he saw someone executed and then he come said, back, he if, still wouldn't believe. What, what was what was the what was the example you gave him? I, I said, Matt, let's just say here we're having this debate. It was in Austin, Texas. It was uh, I think it was two years ago, and I said, look, what if uh, a terrorist came in right now and said, Lacona, you've debated Muslims. You've said that Islam is a false religion. Um, <clears throat> uh, you must die, and they behead me right there. Every yeah, everybody sees this, um, and then they flee and then everybody is terrified they go out in the hall and as they're talking to police and media an hour later i come walking out of the auditorium my i'm alive i'm in good health my head's attached you can see a scar where they beheaded me mm -hmm. and i said hey matt uh just want to let you know i was in heaven and god sent me back to proclaim once again that jesus is alive that uh that jesus is lord and while I was in heaven, I met a friend of yours who died three years ago uh, who, with whom you had a private conversation. Nobody else knew the, the contents of that conversation, and but he shared it with me, and here's what you guys discussed. And you know very well, Matt, that nobody else knew of this conversation except you and your friend who died. And I'm repeating it accurately to you. And now you see me alive after being executed. Would you at least at that point believe that there is a spiritual dimension of reality? And he said, I don't know, probably not. Mm. And I said, well, the problem isn't a lack of evidence. The problem is your epistemology. You have painted yourself into a corner where no amount of evidence would convince you. And he disputed that, <clears throat> denied that. But then later on, I think it was uh, la uh, maybe later on that same year or early last year um i saw a facebook page i think it was the bible and beer consortium and they asked someone asked the atheist and said look just curious if you could if we could prove to you 
that Christianity is true. Beyond any doubt, you could know beyond any doubt that Christianity is true. Would you become a Christian? And a number of atheists, including Matt Dillahunty, said no. So they, per they pretend as mm. though evidence matters, mm. but it really doesn't. There's no amount of evidence that could convince them because of how they painted themselves in an epistemological corner. And even if they were convinced that Christianity was true, they still wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. So that just shows in many cases, not all, but in many cases, mm -hmm. it's not a lack of evidence or the quality of evidence uh, that we can present. People just don't want to believe. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, uh, mm -hmm. oddly, it's, it's, ext it's extremely common and far more common among the sort of leaders of atheism mm -hmm. than people are aware of. Uh, Richard Dawkins recently was in a discussion with uh, Peter Bogosian, who he wrote his manual for creating atheists or something like that. Um, but the, the, they were asked uh, what evidence would convince them that God exists. And, and Dawkins said, you know, you know, in the past, I might have said if I walk out and I hear a big booming voice saying, Richard Dawkins, believe in me, then. Uh, but I've come to I've come to realize that if that happened, it would be just more it would be much more probable explanation that I'm hallucinating. And they got to the point in their discussion, Richard Dawkins and Peter Bogosian, um, that even if even if uh, God were to write a message out in the stars, believe in me, they would conclude that aliens did it, right? So notice, there's the point was there's nothing that God could do. Peter Atkins, the the Oxford uh, atheist chemist, was on uh, Justin Brearley, and and uh, he was asked the question, what evidence would would convince you? He said nothing. He said that even if he died and found himself standing outside the pearly gates with Saint Peter there talking to him, he still wouldn't believe any of it, right? So you've got, so notice this comes down to a matter of the will, right? And just to be clear, we're not saying all, all people are that closed off. It's just interesting that the people who are put forward to us as the atheists who always go where the evidence points are now acknowledging that they will never accept any evidence, no matter what it is, right? God could be standing in front of them, blasting lightning bolts. They will not believe. They would rather conclude that it's aliens or demons trying to trick them or something like that, but certainly not God. They will never believe it, right? So... We know, we know for a fact that a lot of what we believe is a matter of the will. And there's a, there's a kind of spectrum there. There could be people who are like extreme, would not accept any evidence like that, or people who would uh, demand more evidence than we have and so on. But this comes down to people. And so at the end of the day, the question is, what kind of person are you? If God gave a miracle almost 2000 years ago and someone who lived his life performing miracles and was known as a miracle worker, was publicly executed by the most brutal and efficient executors who had ever executionists who had ever lived, uh, the Romans, and was seen by numerous witnesses afterwards, uh, more than 500, according to the the, uh, the early creed that we have, um, was seen by more than 500 people. Some, uh, most of them friends, but some foes as well. And these people were willing to go to their horrible, bloody deaths, proclaiming it so that you had no other alternative explanation. You can't explain it with, uh, by you know, demonic possession. You can't explain it by hallucinations. You just have no alternative explanation. Um, the only explanation that actually fits the facts that we know historically, if the, the only explanation that actually fits the facts is that Jesus rose from the dead, are you going to believe in it? And there are people who say no. Here's a here's a comment here. Uh, I'll put by DJM in the uh, in the super chat. Uh, DJM said, uh, "I believe that Jesus Christ was crucified, but I don't believe in any resurrection. Nonetheless, I wish you guys all the best. If belief in God and the resurrection is helpful and beneficial, great. Uh, take care, guys." So notice here he's saying he, he's he's been listening to the discussion. Uh, he knows that he knows what scholars uh, take as historical facts, uh, but. I just, I just don't believe in it. And so notice there are people here who believe, there are people here who don't believe, there are people here who acknowledge that they would never believe no matter what the evidence is. Um, but notice the, it's not the evidence that's changing. Again, people can be unaware of the evidence, but it's not the evidence that's changing, it's us. There are different kinds of people here. And so at the end of the day, um, Donna, it comes down to the, the sort of person. What sort of, what sort of person are you? Are you the sort of person who's going to believe that 
in a miracle, if that's the only explanation that fits the evidence, or are you going to say it may be the only uh, it may be the only explanation that fits the evidence, but I, I'm, not, I'm not going to believe it anyway. So that's the question. All right, Mike, we've been going a long time. It's almost been two hours. We have a ton more questions, uh, of course, but I think we need to go ahead and close out. Uh, go ahead and uh, take as much time as you need for any uh, concluding thoughts. Oh, well. Thanks for bearing with us for these two hours, and it's been just delight sharing this time with you all. Um, come on over to, to my YouTube channel. It's just go to Mike Lacona on YouTube, L-I-C-O-N-A. I guess you'll provide a link. The link is already in the description okay. box for those of you who want to uh, subscribe to Mike's channel. He's already got a lot of content there. He's got a lot of debates he's had um, in the past. Uh, those are there. Several makes, with Muslims. Yeah, he makes he makes videos, and he's going to be uh, he's doing he's doing cool video series where he talks to uh, other apologists and scholars and records the conversations on on various topics. So we're you going to do some tomorrow. Yeah, so you want to check those out? And yeah, so he, even if you don't like Mike at all and you just like me, well, I'm about to be on there, so <laughs> you want to uh, you want to check that out. But uh, yeah, so the link there in the description box, and Mike's going to be putting out a lot more stuff on YouTube in the subscribe uh, years. and then hit the little bell there, so you get notified when something new comes out. Hit the bell. Um, all right, anything else? Yeah. Um, hey, you know, for those of you who may be interested in Christian apologetics, I do teach at Houston Baptist University. We've got a fantastic program. Um, and a uh, master of arts in Christian apologetics. And there's a couple of different routes you can go. It's fully accredited, regionally accredited. So it's the highest kind of accreditation you can get in the US. Um, you can do the entire thing at a distance. And we've just got fantastic faculty members like William Lane Craig, Craig Evans, Nancy Piercy, Jerry Walt, I'm, uh, Mary Jo Sharp, Holly Ordway. I mean, I, I just go on and on. We just have fantastic professors. And and we don't require you to take any kind of theological positions. Uh, you know, we teach we teach you how to think there. And um, so it's it's just a great program. Come on, visit my website, risenjesus.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yep. good to be with you, David. All right. Uh, now two, two quick comments uh, here at the end. Uh, Rizaview said, uh, David, I was so excited to know you were in Georgia. As a former Muslim, I am so thankful for you and your videos. You rock. I have learned so much. Any plans for a group meet here? Um, no, but we're, 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 we're a little north of Atlanta. Uh, leave, me, leave me a comment if, you're in, if you happen to be in that area and not some other area. Uh, we are uh, meeting with someone else for lunch tomorrow. So if you wanted to, if you're in that area north of Georgia, uh, I mean north of Atlanta, then, um, then we could try and fit you in. So leave me a comment afterwards or, or contact me by email. Uh, one last comment by a Muslim here. Um, Walid said, first of all, God is too great to turn into a human. It makes no sense. And secondly, if God did turn into a human, uh, people will start creating idols such as Christians. Uh, notice God is too great to turn into a human. Um, what do you mean? C can your God do that or not? If, if not, then your God is not great enough to, to turn into a human. The real problem you have here uh, Walid, you should be thinking, of course, God can turn into a human if he wants, right? I mean, in the Quran, Surah 27, Allah appears as fire, right? He appears as the fire and speaks to Moses, speaks mm. out of the fire. So if God can speak out of the fire, you mean he can't speak out of human flesh, right? So, so it, it, wouldn't it be beneath God to appear as a fire? That's what he does to Moses, according to the Quran, Surah 27, verses 7 to 9. You can read it. He speaks out of the fire. He says, blessed is he who is in the fire, talking about himself. And then he says, I am Allah, right? So what, what are you doing here? But uh, so you have to believe in a God who can enter into fire, but you don't want to believe in a God who entered human flesh. You should, as a Muslim, believe that God is powerful enough. And what you should be saying is he just wouldn't do that for some reason. Um, but the question, the real reason you don't believe that God would do that is you believe in a defective God, right? The God of Christianity is perfect, and so he's perfect in his attributes, right? God is, God's love and mercy are perfect, but his justice is also perfect. And what that means is the God of Christianity is not going to let any sin slide. Someone, uh, you know, God could just say, hey, you know, you guys have done horrible things. I'm going to let those things go. Uh, that would be nice, but it wouldn't be perfect in, in, in his justice, right? But the God of Christianity is perfect in justice. And so... He's perfect in his justice. And so at, at the end, at, at the, by the time we get to the judgment, all sin has been punished in Christianity, right? God punishes all sin. Either Jesus took it upon himself or you, you take the penalty upon yourself. So in Christianity, God's justice is perfect. 
uh, in Islam, uh, God's justice is just not perfect. God can just say, eh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm just going to let all that sin slide. And Muslims look and go, see, God can do whatever he wants. You can call that whatever you want, but his justice is not perfect. He lets a lot of sin slide. So that's one issue you have. The other issue you have is that Allah just isn't loving, right? All, the Quran is filled with all with examples of all the people, all the kinds of people Allah doesn't love. He doesn't love unbelievers. He doesn't love us because we're unbelievers according to you, right? So he doesn't love us. Guess what? The God of the Bible loves us all. He loves us before we ever loved him, right? The God of Islam is the exact opposite. He will love you if you first love him and obey him, right? So the reason you really have problem with the idea of a God who would enter creation is you don't believe in a God who would love you that much. And you don't believe in a God whose justice is so perfect that he has to punish all sin. And so you don't believe in a God who's ever been put in that position of saying, wait a minute, I'm confronted with human sinners and my justice says that I have to punish them, but my love and mercy say that I should forgive them. What do I do in this situation? Well, we have the solution. We have the solution in Christianity. God enters creation to pay the price for us so that if we receive his righteousness, then we can be forgiven. So that's the situation that, that we have in Christianity. The solution in Islam is, to, is just to diminish God and make God imperfect and flawed and defective. And so Islam is one massive mound of blasphemy against God. You don't have a perfect God. We have a perfect God. And so you're looking at Christianity and saying, oh, your God entered into, into, hum, into humanity. Look at why he did it. Look at why he did it. He did it because he has perfect attributes that, that cry out for a response to the problem of human sin. You, you don't have a God like that because in Islam, God is just this weak, defective being. He, he seems more like a genie than the God that we read about in the Bible. So I uh, hope that helps, Waleed. And uh, by the way, guys, we'll, I'll, I'll be live again tomorrow night, Lord willing, at 8 o'clock p.m. This time, uh, at least the beginning, I'll be with... Uh, Tim Stratton will be talking about free will and Molinism and uh, reconciling God's sovereignty uh, with human freedom and things like that. So we're going to be talking about that tomorrow night. And uh, if, we, if we have time, we'll, we'll, we'll just uh, get to some questions and so on. But we'll be doing that tomorrow. Other than that, we'll be working on YouTube and videos and stuff. So uh, thanks to Mike for, for joining me here. Again, uh, links to his books, if you want those, uh, those are in the description box. Uh, definitely subscribe to his YouTube channel and catch you all tomorrow.